What is up, everybody, and welcome back to my channel. Sit down, buckle in. Today's video is quite possibly one of the wildest cases I've ever researched. I have been trying to throw in more missing persons cases lately. I have been kind of more drawn to unsolved murders or solved murders. Um, and I really wanted this week to be a missing persons case, but that is until I briefly read a description in my suggestion form that someone had sent me this case on. This is the most insane thing I have ever looked into, and I am still unsure of where this case technically stands. I don't know if it's open. I don't know if it's solved, but I won't get into it. We'll get there later. Or if it's unsolved. I'm confused and honestly terrified after looking into this case. So here I am today with the solved but unsolved, open, maybe not open anymore, murder of Stephanie Crow. So Stephanie was only 12 years old when she was murdered in the bedroom of her own home in Escondido, California on January 20th, 1998 possibly into the early morning hours of the 21st. I've seen a lot of conflicting information on what time she died. I've seen it had to have been between 10 and 10.30 on the 20th. I've seen at the very latest 11 p.m. on the 20th. Honestly, there's just so much madness happening in this case that I'm gonna give it all to you and you guys can do your own research. I've listed all of my sources down below, including the actual case law files and everything. Christmas, she was the type of person that no matter where she went, she made friends. She was always on the go. I was driving her everywhere. <laughs> she was caring and loving. She sacrificed herself. She helped others all the time. The whole family had gone to bed that night around, I think, about 9.30 p.m., so on the 20th of January. She had a younger sister and an older brother. I know her older brother was 14. I have absolutely no idea how old her younger sister was. Her brother had been sick that day with a fever. It seems like it's not important to mention, but trust me, it is. Um, but that night, they all went to bed. According to the documents from court itself. Her mother actually laid in bed until about 11 p.m. Another thing that's wildly important to note. So during the night, Stephanie's mom and dad both recalled hearing different thumps and bumps, but they didn't really think anything of it. Honestly, when you have kids, it's pretty typical. I'll hear different noises and know they probably are just going from one be one's bed to the other. Um, so it's not that odd that they didn't seem very alarmed. But at 6.30 a.m. the morning of the 21st, Stephanie's grandmother walked into her room and found her, I believe, in her doorway dead from nine different stab wounds. This was completely unexpected. It made absolutely no sense and the entire family went crazy. They had just found, you know, this 12 year old girl, their daughter, their granddaughter, their sister dead in the floor of their bedroom. And somehow not a single person in this house noticed anything the night before. And from what I'm assuming, based on the fact that the grandmother found her at 630 in the morning, I'm assuming the grandmother was there as well. Meaning that five other people were in the house other than Stephanie and no one heard anything. They frantically called the Escondido police to report that Stephanie had been murdered and very, very quickly, things turned incredibly ugly. When authorities arrived, they checked the home thoroughly and found absolutely no sign of forced entry, but they did find a lot of unlocked doors and windows. The window to Stephanie's room in particular was unlocked. There was, however, a screen. The screens kind of like slightly lock into place, but according to the way that the dirt and everything was on the screen, it did not appear as if it had been touched. There was also a door open that led into Stephanie's parents' room. It was a sliding glass door. Apparently it was found partially open, um, but again, Stephanie's mom had been awake until about 11 and they said they heard thumps and bumps during the night, which makes me feel like they had been woken up a few other times, but had just gone to bed. So it's not likely someone got in through that door. It's possible, just not likely. And then there was also a door that was beside the garage that led into the home that was unlocked as 
well. So while there was no sign of forced entry, that didn't mean no one got in because there were three different opportunities for someone to get into the home, including one that led directly into Stephanie's room. However, things were still confusing because there was absolutely no sign an intruder had been in the home. No one had gone through anything in the home. There was no knife left behind. There was no knife taken from the home. So it just didn't really make a lot of sense. Authorities pretty quickly started to believe that this was an inside job between the way she was found and the lack of the forced entry. It was also strange because when they questioned and spoke to everyone in the home at the house, when they went to investigate, Michael, the older brother said that he had actually been up around 4.30 in the morning. He would have had to walk by Stephanie's bedroom and he said he thought all the doors were closed. He was getting more Tylenol because he didn't feel well. As I said, he had this fever. He said he got the Tylenol in the kitchen and went back to bed, didn't notice anything strange, which wasn't adding up to the 10 to 10.30, possibly 11 p.m. time frame that Stephanie was likely murdered because she was in her doorway and I believe there would have been no possible way for the door to have been closed at this point. Because of this, the family was ripped apart. Every single family member was brought in for questioning. Every single one, the grandmother, the sister, the brother, the parents, they were all strip searched and photographed, partially nude. Essentially, they were checked for any kind of injury. If Stephanie had fought back, they were searched for scratches and they had all of their clothes taken from them to look for any possible blood. Authorities ended up forcing the whole family to not go back to the home because the whole thing was being considered a crime scene because again, they believed it was an inside job. So Stephanie's parents were put into a hotel, but Stephanie's younger sister and older brother were taken to a local shelter, essentially, a, a county shelter. Um, and this shelter was for children that are taken away from their parents because of possible danger. So at this point, it's very obvious authorities believed someone in this family definitely was involved in Stephanie's murder. Now, there are so many problems that start here and do not end and do not ever end essentially. So for two days, everybody was questioned pretty thoroughly and without the parents knowledge, Stephanie's younger sister and older brother were also being questioned at the county shelter. But Michael, her older brother in particular, was being brought back and forth from the shelter to the police station to be questioned more thoroughly than anyone else by police. And all of this again was done without the parents' knowledge and, get this, without a lawyer present. Very quickly, Michael became authority's main suspect in the murder of Stephanie. And Michael was only 14 years old at the time of all of this. They never asked anyone's permission to question him. Um, I know they did read him his Miranda rights, but they did not read, I think, the rest of the family their Miranda rights. Um, and they basically formed their opinion that he was guilty of something because they said that he was, and in their words, distant and preoccupied while the investigation was going on. It seemed like he didn't care too much that his sister had died, but if you were to look at the case files and everyone that got to see the interview footage, it was put in there that it was very obvious he was in a lot of distress. So from what it's seeming like, authorities just kind of created this idea in their head and went with it. So they ended up using horrific tactics in their interviews. They falsely told Michael that they found physical evidence at the scene proving it was him. They said that they found blood in his room and that they lifted fingerprints off of this blood and the fingerprints were back to him. They also told him directly that his parents believed he was responsible for Stephanie's murder, which was not true at all. His parents had never ever said that. They also told him that he failed a truth verification test. So essentially they told him that they needed to make sure he was telling the truth and that the government used this special machine um, that was very, very accurate. He did agree to take this truth verification test, which I think was only a voice analyzer. I don't even think it was a polygraph test. 
Um, and they told him that he failed it, which meant that he killed her. Like that is directly what they said. And to give you guys a better example of the way that they treated him and the questions that they asked him and how directly they accused him, here are some quotes taken from his interrogation that Michael himself said and some of the back and forth banter between Michael and the investigators. The detective shows Michael the charts of his performance on the so-called truth exam. They indicate he lied when he answered no to question 12. Do you know who took Stephanie's life? Maybe there's something we need to understand about Michael and about your sister that we didn't understand and maybe somebody could have helped. It's okay. It's okay to feel the way you feel. I really okay, but I don't know. I don't know why I'd say that. I, I swear. I swear to God, I don't know. I'm looking at you right now, okay? And inside, you're about ready to burst. We can't bring her back. She's gone. Okay? You're fighting it. You're... you're, you're I don't know what to do anymore. I understand. You know, I'm being told that I'm lying. I'm, I'm not, not lying. saying... Michael, I'm not saying that. Have you heard me say that? What if they come back and say to you, Michael, we have your hair. They say, Michael, we have your hair in her hand. And all of a sudden, you go, now what? I mean, what are you going to do at that point? I mean, at I, that that point, I would have to completely blank out and get it without knowing it. Because I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Hypothetically. Could that have happened? <laughs> No, not that I know of. Not that you know of. I, like I said, I would have to be completely unaware of it. Okay. <laughs> have you ever blacked out before? No, never. Okay, I believe you. I believe you. <laughs> if I knew who did it, you would know. Everyone would know right now. Okay, more. <laughs> Because whoever did it, I, if I ever find out, I'll take them forever. I love her. I love her deeply. You know, there's a lot of blood. It's very difficult. It's very difficult. You mean stay with me, Michael. It's very difficult for the person who did it not to, not to, to get blood on them. Yeah. Okay? And not to transfer that blood to other parts of the house. Yeah. We found blood in your room already. God. We use we use processes called. Where'd you find it? Pardon me. Where'd you find the blood? I, I'm sure you, you know. What? God, I don't. I no. I don't know. I didn't do it. I swear to that. Does that mean you can't tell me about the knife? I don't. What are we talking about? Okay. I. What are you talking about? You're 14? Yes. You got your whole life ahead of you, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, oh, God. God. Why? You tell me. Why are you doing this to me? If I did this, I don't remember it. I don't okay. remember it then. I... And you know what? That's possible. have my personal guarantee that the help you need to accept this is going to be forthcoming. That is what the system is geared for. I want to go down that path. No, no, no. Cut, cut it out. Cut it out, Mike. Cut it out. The reason I'm sounding impatient, Mike, is 
the eleventh hour is rapidly approaching. All this evidence is going to be in. We put a rush on some things that, quite frankly, is going to bury you, my friend. This would obviously break any 14-year-old child. This is scary. He was questioned for hours on end, for days on end. He was not allowed to see his parents. He had everything taken away from him. His sister had just died. He was emotionally fragile and he was a juvenile. So after six hours of his last interview, he ended up telling authorities that he killed his sister. Now, authorities spent hours convincing him that there was a good Michael and a bad Michael to the point of when they asked him right before he ended up confessing what his biggest fear was. He said that he was terrified that he had someone else inside of him that he didn't know. They were scaring the actual piss out of this 14 year old kid that was going through an emotionally traumatizing time in his life, convincing him that he had another personality or person within him. And essentially because of this, he said that he did it. Uh, he provided pretty much no details whatsoever, as you saw when it comes to all the questions. Um, he just repeatedly said that he didn't remember doing it and that he was only confessing because it was what authorities wanted to hear. And all of this was captured on tape. Michael ended up being arrested and charged with his sister's murder and it absolutely destroyed the family. But authorities wanted to keep on piling up evidence because they had lied. They had no physical evidence proving he did it. They had this, you know, kind of like halfway confession that they knew they coerced out of him. So they started to go and interview his friends, hoping that they could kind of get answers out of them that would fit into their narrative, essentially. Michael had two close friends from Oceanside, which is a neighboring town, I believe, to Escondido. Two 15-year-old boys named Joshua and Aaron. Now, authorities went to the homes of both of these boys, and for each one, the parents weren't home. So both Joshua and Aaron told authorities, I'm alone right now, my parents aren't home. At this point, Authorities shouldn't have technically questioned them, but you better believe that they did anyways. During questioning Aaron, they ended up finding out that a knife from his collection was missing. All of the boys were into role play and medieval things and fantasy worlds and they, you know, really played a lot together and Aaron had a collection of these medieval knives and swords and everything of the sort. So authorities found it interesting when they ended up at Joshua's house and they noticed a knife sitting on the couch, very similar to the description of the one that Aaron said was missing. Now, Joshua immediately said it was his brother's knife and then his brother said it wasn't, it was his knife. So it seemed really, really sketchy. This was all authorities really needed to say that this knife was actually the potential murder weapon. So Joshua, the last one with the knife, was brought to the police station and questioned for 11 hours straight. Now, if I'm right, he was picked up at 9 p.m. at night and was questioned until 8 a.m. the next morning. He had begged them to sleep. He had, you know, asked them all these things. It was the middle of the night. He was a 15 year old boy. And finally, after they refused over and over again to let him sleep, do the things that he needed to do, he finally broke and said that Aaron gave him the knife so that he could kill Stephanie. After this, they released Joshua and then brought him in a few days later to convince him to call Aaron on a monitored phone call to get him to confess that he gave this knife to him. But it didn't go the way that authorities had planned because Aaron kept saying, you know, what are you talking about? I was not involved in this. I never gave you my knife for that. So one week later, Joshua was questioned again for more information. And after 12 hours, it ended in a more detailed confession. And the same exact manipulative techniques they used on Michael, they used on Joshua. Now Joshua's confession was enough to arrest Aaron. Aaron never ended up giving a confession. Uh, instead, he kind of offered up this hypothetical confession and they got this through the use of an interrogation method called the Reed Technique. Now I'm about to tell you guys about the Reed Technique and it's going to 
infuriate you. This technique was developed by a man named John Reed in the 1950s. Reed was a polygraph expert and former Chicago police officer, and he believed that his psychological method that he came up with when it came to interrogations was the most useful, particularly when extracting confessions from individuals that were um, especially unwilling to cooperate, I guess you could say. However, this technique is very, very controversial. Now, some love this technique, while others have actually found that statistically, it shows an alarmingly high rate of providing false confessions. It basically gets people to confess that are innocent, especially juveniles, keep that in mind. Um, it does the same thing for those that you know, speak English as a second language or those that have some sort of mental disability or reduced intellectual capacity. Even the very first case that this technique was used on, the case that got John Reed famous and this technique famous, even in that very first circumstance, it was later found out the man was innocent. This man confessed to killing his wife a day after they started interrogating him using this method. And all these officers and investigators were like, holy crap, this method got a confession out in a day. We spend months, years sometimes trying to get confessions out of people and this worked in a day. Um, so he ended up being tried and found guilty. And then John Reed was like, oh crap, I just created something awesome. I'm going to copyright it, claim it as mine. And everyone started adapting this technique but little did they know that years later, this man would be found as actually not guilty. The real murderer would be found and it would come out that this was a false confession because of this method. So the technique itself uses three phases, starting with fact analysis, then behavioral analysis, and then the read nine step interrogation method. In a nutshell, it's an accusatory approach where investigators basically tell the suspect straight up they're guilty for the crime and that authorities know it. So the nine steps are, and I'm reading from a list down here because I can remember a lot, but I cannot remember this absurdity. Um, the first step is direct confrontation. And I'm, I'm literally reading these steps. These are the actual steps you take. Direct confrontation. Advise the suspect that the evidence points to their guilt. So you're not even giving people a chance to speak their mind or say whatever. You're coming right off the bat and being like, all right, number one, you're guilty. So the second step is to shift the blame from the suspect to another person or set of circumstances that prompted them to commit the crime. This sets a theme of justification. So... You're basically telling the person, hey, you know, you might have done this because someone convinced you to do it. Um, you know, you're basically teaching their brain that they can justify their actions and it will be okay as long as they say, oh, well, this made me do it. Number three, minimize the suspect's denial. So basically every time they try to deny the crime, counter it with why they're guilty. The next one, is usually at this point a justification for why they did or didn't commit the crime comes. So at this point, the person they are interrogating is getting a little bit frantic, really defending themselves, and the method says to use this as a time to help them acknowledge that they did commit the crime. So while this person is trying to explain why they didn't, you are using what they're saying to tell them why they did. The next one is reinforce sincerity to hopefully gain their trust. The next step is at this point, the suspect usually becomes quiet. Use this to talk about alternatives. Now I'm not exactly sure what this means. Maybe alternatives as in like, if you confess, like we can do this for you, like alternatives in sentencing or maybe alternatives in what happened, which kind of leads into the next step that says, give the suspect two choices for what happened. So you're telling them the two ways that it happened and they have to pick which one it was. And the catch of this, and it says it in the steps, is that both options equal guilt. <laughs> so both options leads to them confessing to guilt. You are supposed to give them an option that's just more socially acceptable than the other, so it sounds like a better way, and it sounds like a way out for them, a way for them to escape this nightmare, but in reality, it still means they are admitting to doing something wrong. The next one is to get the suspect to then confess this 
in front of a witness. And then the last step is to document this via audio, video, or written statement. So you can see why this is a disaster of a technique to interrogate someone, especially a child. And also, especially when it's known that it creates false confessions regarding children. Um, there are several countries in Europe that have banned this. I'm pretty sure Canada's banned it. I couldn't get a straight answer because it uses deception, manipulation, and it is guilt presumptive. So it's not seen as an efficient method. There are so many different ways and different points in those nine steps where I can see how Aaron created a hypothetical confession. And, uh, you know, was it step two where the blame is shifted to another person or another set of circumstances? You know, did he go along with these other sets of circumstances to just get these investigators to leave him alone? Or was it maybe step seven when he was given two choices, both equaling guilt? Maybe one of them was a hypothetical, you know, choice and that's the one he took and that's why he was pinned with a hypothetical confession. Either way, on February 11th, Aaron was arrested while at school and he actually was interrogated on his 15th birthday. However, at this point, the kids had lawyers, they had their families understanding what was going on and they became aware of the method that was used, not just on Aaron, but on the other boys as well. So all three boys ended up uh, recanting their statement made to authorities and they claimed coercion. So Michael's confession ended up being ruled as coerced because there were many different implications made by authorities that he would receive leniency if he confessed. You're a child, you're 14 years old. Nobody's gonna hold you to the same standards that they would some criminal on the street. On top of that, he was given this ultimatum and there was, you know, this good Michael and bad Michael that was presented and that is entirely illegal. So they completely took away his confession. Joshua actually confessed twice. He confessed to Oceanside authorities and to Escondido authorities. So they didn't take it away. They just labeled it as redundant and took away the Oceanside and, uh, confession and just left the Escondido confession. Um, so that was still admissible. Josh was still technically confessed and Aaron's statements also ended up being suppressed. It wasn't even considered technically a real confession, but he was not actually told his Miranda rights. Now, despite Michael's confession being thrown out and Aaron's statements being thrown out, all three boys continued to be charged with murder and conspiracy to commit murder. And a judge even ruled that every single one of them be tried as an adult. Witnesses had come forward from the juvenile center that Michael was being held at and they all stated that Michael had confessed to them as well that he had murdered his sister. So at this point, authorities are thinking it doesn't matter that our confession with him got thrown out. We've got witnesses, other witnesses stating he confessed to it as well. They also found out that he was into this fantasy world, this medieval times thing, and he, I guess, was into fantasy writings, particularly about maiming and slaughter at the time of her death. So they saw this as him having this sick fascination. He also had a motive because he had admitted during his questioning that he was jealous of his sister. Boys were incarcerated for a total of six months while waiting for trial. And just as Joshua's trial was about to start in January of 1999, evidence was found that stopped absolutely everything in its tracks. And as if this hasn't been insane enough as it is, what happens next makes me so much more confused and frustrated and infuriated than I even have been this entire time. When Stephanie's body was discovered on the 21st of January in 1998, a 28-year-old man named Richard Raymond Tewitt, I think is how you pronounce his last name, he was questioned by authorities and for very, very good reason. He was known around Escondido as being a transient that roamed the streets. Uh, he was seen in Stephanie's neighborhood the night of her murder. Now, he wasn't just seen in the neighborhood. He wasn't just this roaming transient that night. He was actually reported to police multiple, multiple times at night by a bunch of Stephanie's neighbors. So that night, 911 received multiple phone calls from people in the neighborhood saying that there was a man, this man named Richard Raymond Tewitt, knocking on their windows and their doors. 
uh, and he was obviously drunk or high. He just definitely wasn't in his right mind. He was trying to get inside of these homes. Um, and when he was questioned by authorities because of this, he had a bunch of cuts and scrapes on his body, including his hands. And if you're not aware, those are typically wounds you get when someone is defending themselves. So because of this, they actually decided to go ahead and confiscate his clothing. And as they were doing that, they found items in his pocket that were from the crow's home. Now, I had not seen this on any article whatsoever until I started reading the case files. So despite the scratches being on his hands, despite these items in his pocket being from the crow home, despite the fact that he had been trying to get into people's houses, windows, and doors in Stephanie's neighborhood on the night of the murder, authorities decided that he was not a person of interest whatsoever because he was a diagnosed schizophrenic and they believed he was not capable of committing a murder. But the evidence that came back proved them so incredibly wrong because Richard had three drops of blood on his shirts that had been confiscated and the DNA matched Stephanie Crow. Because of this, charges were dismissed against the boys, but in a way that they could be reinstated in the future if need be. So while the boys technically weren't being charged anymore, authorities could easily snatch them back up again and charge them with Stephanie's murder. Escondido police and the San Diego district attorney were so incredibly embarrassed that they had just completely traumatized these three young men and their family that they just let the case sit without charges for two whole years. So it wasn't until 2001 that they finally asked the California Department of Justice to take over the case so they didn't have to deal with it anymore. And in May of 2002, Richard was charged with Stephanie's murder. And then in two years later, in 2004, the trial began, but not without even more drama. On the very first day of jury selection, Richard was being kept in the holding tank in the courtroom and everyone took a break for lunch. Now, somehow Richard managed to get his handcuffs off, get out of the courthouse, board a bus and leave. Uh, this is like Ted Bundy level madness right now. And I don't know how he managed to do it. This is a man that potentially stabbed a young woman nine times after breaking into her home, but he managed to escape. Now they did eventually find him hours later. He was given extra charges for his flea attempt, but what the actual heck? How do you let that happen? According to the neighborhood, Richard was going around, he was banging on people's doors, banging on people's windows, he appeared again either high or drunk, and he ended up knocking on one person's door and the owner of the home mistook it for a neighbor knocking, so they actually opened the door and Richard just walked in the house. He walked in like it was his own. He started demanding to talk to someone named Tracy. He said that Tracy had denied him years before and he was mad about it and wanted to get back at her. Um, so again, clearly he was not um, thinking well at the moment because this is something that had happened years earlier. The woman kept telling him, you know, Tracy doesn't live here. I don't know you. I don't know Tracy. So he eventually left the house only to turn back around, open the door back up and again, just walk inside the stranger's home where he again started demanding to talk to Tracy. And then he eventually did leave. Now at 7.50, 911 was called again to report him behaving strangely near the Crow home. This is at 7.50, this is about an hour and a half before everyone went to get into bed. Now at this point, I don't think any authorities had responded to any of these 911 calls. I think everyone was just kind of hoping he was going to leave. But then at 9.28, another neighbor of the Crows called 911 saying that this man started knocking on his door and started screaming about needing to find a girl. Um, I'm assuming that was Tracy. So he was seen multiple times in this neighborhood. He kept asking multiple people for a girl or a woman named Tracy. He was seen multiple times around the Crow home. I mean, he's seen once near the Crow home at eight and then he's seen there again at 9.30. Um, it's clear he was just kind of circulating this area. He was seen at a local church screaming, I'm going to kill this B-I-T-C-H, trying to not curse on my channel. Um, but, 
he had some clear problems happening. So authorities finally dispatched someone to the scene. Now, the officer approached the scene uh, probably around like 9.40ish, 9.45ish. It was at least, you know, after the call was made at 9.30, which means this is right around the time the whole Crow family was going to bed. And when he approached the Crow home, he noticed the door beside their garage close. Now, he didn't question it. He assumed it was someone in the house, but remember back to the multiple details I have stated in the beginning of this video, one of the unlocked doors in the Crow's home was the door by the garage. This man, there's proof that he was just going into people's houses. The multiple reports said he was trying to get into people's houses. We know for a fact he got into someone's house. And then this officer sees a door close in one of the last homes he was seen by. And then someone in this home, a girl, you know, someone he stated he was looking for, ended up being murdered after he was standing in a church parking lot saying he was going to kill someone. Either way, the officer didn't really check anything. And at 9.56, he left the scene and reported back that he could not find the strange man any longer, probably because the strange man had just entered the Crow home. Despite all of this information in May of 2004, Richard was acquitted of murder, and instead of murder, he ended up being charged and convicted of manslaughter. So he was sentenced only 13 years in prison, plus I believe four extra years for the flight attempt. And it didn't take long for Richard to start appealing. He said that his Sixth Amendment rights were violated due to lack of cross-examination. But in 2006, the court found that a judge had in fact made an error. There was a lack of cross-examination. It was limited, but they said that it didn't affect the conviction. So they stuck to it, but he kept fighting. And then in 2011, the court of appeals voted two to one to overturn his manslaughter conviction due to issues with the DNA evidence, lack of evidence in general, and the lack of cross-examination. Now, when it came to DNA evidence and lack of evidence, Richard was saying that cross-contamination in the lab actually is what caused Stephanie's blood to be found on his shirt. It was found out that the investigators did not wear booties when they were inside of the crime scene, meaning it's very possible they picked blood up on their shoes and somehow transferred it. On top of that, the shirt wasn't found until the next day. Because of this, Richard was granted a retrial in 2013. So Richard's attorney argued that there was no evidence that proved that he was inside of the Crow home. There were no fingerprints of his in the Crow home. None of his DNA was in the Crow home. And they even checked his shirt that had Stephanie's blood on it for any evidence at all of the Crow home. And there was absolutely nothing. And some experts also came forward to testify that when Richard's shirt was originally evaluated and brought in. There had been no blood stains on the shirt. So they're saying it happened sometime in the lab. Now, I have not seen proof of this. I just saw that they said experts said this. I don't know if any of these experts actually testified who they were or if this was just them trying to state it as fact when it wasn't. I have no idea. But the prosecution again brought forward the fact that Richard was in the neighborhood. This door was seen open. It was one of the unlocked doors in the home. It was exactly around the time that she likely was killed. Again, he had been screaming in a church parking lot in the neighborhood. He was going to kill someone. They believed it was very possible that at this time he got into the house. Uh, he possibly assumed Stephanie was Tracy and killed her. Unfortunately though, they don't know what happened. There is no evidence that shows directly what happened once Richard potentially got inside of the house and his defense argued that it would have been too dark for him to even find Stephanie to kill her to begin with. Um, but on that same argument, someone did kill her in the dark and if it was in the dark, he could have easily believed it was Tracy and his state of mind when it wasn't. And they also said that blood was found on more than one of his shirts on the day that they questioned him. So there's that and then the things in his pockets but somehow still in December of 2013, Richard was found not guilty. So at this point, there were a total of four people authorities believed could have possibly murdered Stephanie, but in the end, it's still not been solved. They have put so many people through hell and back, 
through the ringer. There's so much evidence that I personally believe still points to Richard, yet still, no one has been found guilty of this young woman's murder. This family has been through hell and back. They lost their daughter, then they had their son tried for their daughter's murder, then, oh, just kidding, he didn't do it because we have DNA from someone else, but then that person never gets charged. Can you even freaking imagine going through that, all of that? And it took years. This happened in 1998. 1998. Richard wasn't found not guilty until 2013. And not just that, he was found guilty originally, but then got a retrial, which is something I'm sure no one believed would ever happen. And then here we are. And it seems like the reason that he managed to get out of it was simply because of so many errors in the judicial system. And that seems to be just the theme from start to finish. These kids would not have gone through what they went through had the judicial system done what it is supposed to do. If it had followed the rules, they were interviewed properly, you know, things were handled properly from the beginning, it caused three young men to be wrongly accused of killing a young girl. And then if they had properly interrogated and cross-examined everything during the trial of Richard, he potentially could still be in prison right now. I am personally not at all convinced that he is not guilty. While all of this madness is happening, all of Richard's retrial, the family of the young boy were in a lawsuit with Escondido and Oceanside police departments. They were trying to sue them for wrongfully accusing them and destroying their lives, essentially. Could you imagine the trauma that these three young men went through with the different interrogation techniques that were done? You know, I can only imagine how Michael felt in that time. It's hard enough to lose your sister. I've lost my sister. But I can't imagine finding out I lost my sister and then being treated the way that the police treated him with nothing at all to back it. It's absolutely sickening. And then these two young boys were just brought into it willy-nilly. In 2011, however, the Crows finally reached a settlement. I've seen it was $5 million. I've seen it $7.25 million. In 2012, a judge officially made a ruling, and this is incredibly rare apparently, that all three boys were in fact factually innocent of all charges, and they were permanently dismissed of their criminal cases. So as I said before, the charges were dismissed. The case was dismissed at first, but in a way that they could have been reinstated. And this judge said, heck no, they've been through enough. They are not guilty. So they are permanently, you know, released of any type of criminal case against Stephanie's murder. I don't know the status of Joshua and Aaron's cases. I don't know if they ever got a settlement. I sure as heck hope they did. But this case has just blown my absolute mind because after all of this, I mean, it was exhausting just reading through this and they had to live through it. After all of this, there still is technically no closure. Is Richard guilty, but he managed to get away because the judicial system was absolute crap? Possibly. Is he possibly out there a murderer just roaming the streets? Possibly. Is he innocent and it was just a coincidence and someone else has just gotten away scot-free while watching four other people go through hell over what they did? Possibly. It's just an absolute disaster and I just, all I can think about is Stephanie, this 12-year-old girl, innocent as can be, thought she was going to bed one night and had her life taken from her and then all of this happened. Um, I have not been able to see how her family feels. Um, I don't know if they believe that Richard is guilty. I don't know if they believe someone else is. I don't know what their thoughts are on the fact that he was found not guilty. I have no idea what their standing is. I don't know how much they've come to terms with this or if they're still fighting to have justice for their daughter. I have absolutely no idea, but my heart goes out to their entire family. All of these families that are involved in this because this is like one of the biggest injustices that I think I have ever covered on this channel. And as a parent, it has honestly, made me think of things a lot differently. I feel like we assume our children are safe from things like this, not just 
you know, murder, but the way that the justice system will treat them. I feel like everyone sees children as being safe from things like this, but seeing how easily authorities could manipulate these three young men into confessing, that's sick. And it scares me for my children, honestly. Um, heaven forbid there was ever a situation where they end up being questioned by authorities and don't know to ask for a lawyer or don't know to say um, no to authorities unless their parents are with them. I think this is a huge wake up call to me and hopefully to all of you parents out there that are watching to inform your children from a young age. There's just no telling. Not all police officers are bad. Not all investigators are bad. Not every, you know, police department is corrupt and terrible and manipulative, but this shows how bad things can be if they are. And you want to protect your children. You want to protect them as much as you can inform those around you of what their rights are and this is something that i don't really ever speak about on this channel is what our rights are as individuals when it comes to when authorities come to us to question us to ask for polygraph tests to do this to do that research your area research your local laws find out what you can and cannot do look up all the constitutional rights that you have as an individual know them yourself and teach them to your children and make sure you keep yourself safe. I don't know what to think at this point when it comes to who so brutally murdered this poor 12 year old little girl. Stephanie never deserved this. She deserves justice. I am again not convinced that Richard is not responsible whatsoever. Um, granted, I'm sure the trial saw a lot of things that I was unable to see. I read all the case files that I possibly could and I am just not convinced. Again, coincidences are things you stop believing in in situations like this. I just don't believe that he's seen around the Crow house. An officer sees minutes later one of the unlocked doors being closed and somehow he's not the one inside of that home. It's just really, really hard to believe. Let me know what you think down below. I want to thank you guys for listening to Stephanie's story. And again, Take this as a lesson to keep yourself safe and aware of your surroundings, of your rights, and do the same for your children because I don't ever want to see any other children go through something that these three boys had to go through. Anyways, guys, thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button to become a part of the Helen fam so hopefully we can bring them home together and I will see you guys in my next video. Bye.